Hello students. In this video, we're going to discuss the heating curve, what it represents, and how to use it to do calculations for determining the amount of heat. So I just want to start with a really basic heating curve, what it looks like, and how you can read it. So typically, the first thing you want to look at is when you look at your y-axis, this is typically in temperature. When you look at your x-axis, there's usually different uh, values. You could have heat energy that you put into the system. Sometimes they'll just have time, a progression of heat added. But the most common is heat energy added to the system. Now, this particular heating curve is for water. Now, how do I know that? There are two temperatures that are given to me. Okay, so typically your heating curves are assumed at one atmosphere of pressure because that is your standard pressure. What substance has a melting point of zero degrees Celsius and a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius? Water. So how do we read this heating curve? Well, if I was at a negative 25 degrees Celsius, my water hasn't melted yet. So what does that mean? I'm in the solid phase. So right in this region right here, this is a solid. If I add heat to the solid, it would eventually heat up, heat up, heat up, and there's going to be a consistent temperature change right into the point to where I get zero degrees Celsius. And at zero degrees Celsius, if I continue to add energy into the system, now, instead of the energy being used to provide additional kinetic energy and increase the temperature, the energy is being used to do work and separate the particles and disrupt the intermolecular forces. So now the energy is being put into the system to increase potential energy by separating the molecule and disrupting intermolecular forces. So the temperature doesn't change. What happens now is at zero degrees Celsius, if all of the solid reaches this temperature and I keep putting heat in, it stays the same temperature. And that's why you see the curve flattening like this, but I begin to melt it. So at this point, I'm going from a solid to a liquid and I stay at the same temperature. If I keep putting heat, into the system. Eventually, I'll reach this point where everything's at zero degrees Celsius, but now I've converted all the solid and disrupted the intermolecular forces, and now I have more degrees of freedom or freedom of motion, and I'm a liquid. If I keep heating it up, what happens? Now the liquid, which is at zero degrees Celsius, we begin to rise in temperature, and it'll keep rising if you keep adding heat all the way up until you get to where? 100 degrees Celsius. Now why? At 100 degrees Celsius, you no longer heat up the liquid. What begins to happen is a change of state. You begin to disrupt the intermolecular forces and overcome them, and the heat that's added to the system doesn't change the temperature, but it provides more potential energy by separating the molecules, and I end up at this point seeing a flattening of the curve because at 100 degrees Celsius, it no longer changes. It only changes not temperature, but state. It goes from a liquid to a gas, and that we call you know vaporization. But notice the temperature doesn't change. It stays at 100. Once everything's vaporized, if I keep heating it, now the gas or the steam could keep increasing in temperature at that point. And I can get above 100 degrees Celsius. What I wanted to show is in this region, wherever there is a slope or a change in temperature, here there's a positive slope, here there's a positive slope, here there's a positive, wherever there's a slope, or a change in temperature, that's because I have a solid or a liquid 
or a gas. And the energy added goes into a phase change. And we've seen this. We've seen this when we were working with liquid water in thermochemistry, and we used it by measuring the temperature to, turn, to, to, to determine the amount of heat released by using Q equals MCAT. So whenever there's a positive slope or when there is a change in temperature, we're going to use, I'll just call this equation A, Q equals MCAT. So we're going to use that when there's a temperature change. Now, wherever there's a flattening of the curve and there is no temperature change, there's simply a change in state or a phase change, we're going to use a different equation. And we're going to use the equation enthalpy times moles. So I'll call this equation B. And equation B is used when there's a phase change. There's no change in temperature. So where do I see a change in phase? When I melt, what am I going to use here? I'm going to use what's referred to as a heat of fusion. Where else? When I boil or vaporize, here I'm going to use a heat of vaporization. So now how do we apply our understanding of the heating curve to calculations? Well, again, as you heat a liquid, we've seen before, the temperature increases until I reach the boiling point. And we've done this with Q equals MCAT. So this would be my liquid. If I was at 20 degrees Celsius, water is a liquid at 20 degrees Celsius. If I keep heating it up, heating it up all the way to 100 degrees Celsius, then at that point, I would begin to boil. Once that temperature is reached, the heat goes into not changing temperature, but changing it into a gas, overcoming the intermolecular forces and that energy into increasing the potential energy and the separation of the molecules. So where there's a positive slope, I'm using the Q equals MCAT. Where there's no slope or a zero slope or no temperature change, I'm using the enthalpy times moles. And in this case, it's enthalpy of vaporization because I'm at the boiling point or liquid converting into a gas. So I could have a question like, how much heat in kilojoules is required to vaporize 382 grams of water at 100 degrees Celsius? Now, this is important because that's the boiling point of water to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. So realize to go from liquid water to steam requires energy because I have to disrupt those intermolecular forces and add energy. However, there is no temperature change because I'm just saying 100 degrees water to steam. So I'm going to use that equation B that we talked about, right? Where Q equals the heat of vaporization times the moles. No one expects you to know the heat of vaporization. Now, with enough calculations, you'll figure it out, but you don't have to memorize that. It'll be given to you. So all I have to do is plug it into this formula. And you can look at it conceptually as we are focusing right here. We were at 100 degrees liquid, because at this point I'm a liquid. I put in enough energy to convert it all into a gas. So what's the calculation? Oh, and I use that equation. <laughs> the calculation is there's 382 grams. I can convert grams to what? Well, there's 18 grams in one mole of water, and there's 40.7 kilojoules per mole. Moles cancel, I'm up of kilojoules. So for 382 grams of water to vaporize it, if it starts at 100, would require 864 kilojoules. What if they gave you this? How much kilojoules is required to vaporize 68 mils of water at 25 degrees Celsius to steam at 100. 
So now I'm not starting at 100 degrees anymore. So where am I starting? I'm starting at 25 degrees Celsius. And water at 25 degrees Celsius is right here on the heating curve. So what do I first have to do? I have to bring it up to 100 degrees Celsius. And then, oh, and actually to do that, how am I going to bring it from 25 to 100 degrees Celsius? I have to change its temperature. There's that positive slope. What am I going to use? Q equals MCAT. But then I can, from 100 degrees Celsius liquid water, I can boil it and make it 100 degrees Celsius steam. And that's where I used that formula earlier, which is the heat of vaporization times mole. The only thing that's a little tricky here is they give you milliliters, but you already know that there's one gram per mil of water because you know the density of liquid water. So when I plug it in for my Q1 in this point of the curve where I'm going from 25 degrees Celsius, heating it up to 100 degrees Celsius, Q equals MCAT, I know the specific heat of water. 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. I've been using that. I converted the milliliters to grams and the temperature change. Remember, delta T is T final minus T initial. And my final is 100 degrees Celsius because that's right here. And my initial was 25 degrees Celsius. So that's 75 degrees Celsius. So I underline two sig figs here, and I'm left with 21.338 you know, kilojoules, right? Because at first this is joules. So I would divide this by 1,000, one, two, three, to get kilojoules. Next, to figure out this portion of the graph, I use the other equation, 68 grams, convert grams to moles, moles to kilojoules. And I get 153.7 kilojoules, but two sig figs, I go right there. And now all I do to figure out the total heat is add Q1 plus Q2 to get the total heat. And when I do that, I'm underlining the two sig figs at the 150. I'm adding it to the 21.38, so it gives me a 175. So for two sig figs, I look at this, it's five, and I round up, and I get 180 kilojoules. So now for the heat of fusion, right? So we know the heat of vaporization was 40.7. The heat of fusion is 6.02 kilojoules per mole. Now the heat of fusion of water, right? It's a little bit higher than some of these other substances as we see, okay? But the main thing that we wanna realize is the heat of fusion occurs when I'm melting something. It's gonna be an endothermic, endothermic process. To go from a solid to a liquid, I have to disrupt intermolecular forces. So it's gonna require energy and heat and it's positive, so it's endothermic. If I was going in the opposite direction where I was freezing it, so instead of melting, I'm freezing it, and they call that heat of crystallization, it's the same amount, I just change the sign. So generally your heat of fusion, which is going from solid to liquid, is much less than your heat of vaporization because I remember in the gas phase, you have to really put in a lot of energy to overcome the intermolecular forces and create that large of a potential energy difference based on distance. Now, if we're talking sublimation, which is solid straight to gas, the heat of sublimation would be the heat of fusion plus the heat of vaporization because this is covering from solid to liquid, and this is liquid to gas, and this is just the sum of those two. Kind of like Hess's law. So what's the heat curve of just the solid? So again, 
It's linear, so right here below zero degrees Celsius is my solid. From here I go from solid to liquid, and then here I'm liquid again. So once I reach the melting point, all the energy goes into converting a phase change. The temperature stays constant. There is no slope, zero slope. And that's when I convert it into a liquid. And that's where I would use that heat of fusion. So heat of fusion versus vaporization. This graph is to show you there is a big difference in the amount of energy to convert something from a liquid to a gas versus the heat of fusion, which is a solid to a liquid. Because remember, when I discussed in the different states of matter, both solids and liquids have fixed volumes and are called condensed phases because the distance between molecules is relatively close. So to go from a liquid to a gas, you have to put in a lot of energy to separate those molecules and overcome that intermolecular force and create a lot of kinetic energy. So in your book, they do a heating curve and they do a calculation where they show you these values. And I'm just gonna break down the values because it's a little, if you look at it, it's a little confusing where they get all these values on the X axis. The one thing that I like is they number every portion of the curve. So they go from one all the way to five. They don't write this out plainly, but what it basically is, is how much heat in kilojoules is required to heat one mole of water at negative 25 degrees Celsius to steam. So that's why on this graph, they show negative 25 all the way up to 125, so this point. So I'm gonna have to still use Q equals M cap where? When there's a change in temperature. I'm still gonna have to use the enthalpy times mole where? when there's no temperature change, but there's a phase change. So basically this flattening of the curve here. I'm also gonna have to know the specific heats of not just the liquid, because the specific heat of liquid water we've memorized, but the specific heat for gas and ice is different because they have different degrees of freedom. So different modes of absorbing the heat and having a uh, freedom of motion. So their specific heats as a result are different. Nobody expects to, you to memorize that. You'll always probably be given that. The other thing, again, you don't need to know your heat of vaporization or fusion. That's a lot of times given in kilojoules per mole, or they might give it to you in joules per gram. Either way, you can easily convert joules to kilojoules and grams to moles by using molar mass. So let's do this calculation. Let's take one mole of water and go from a negative 25 degrees Celsius to 125. So the first thing is for Q1 right here, what am I doing? I'm going from a negative 25, whoops. I'm going from a negative 25 to zero. So that's a temperature change. So I'm gonna use Q equals MCAT. The mass, well, they tell me it's one mole and water's molar mass is 18 grams per mole. So I have 18 grams and I'm given the specific heat as 2.09. My delta T, how did I get 25? Remember, delta T, T final minus T initial. My final is zero degrees Celsius because I get to this point, the melting point for the solid, and then minus a negative 25, minus a negative just becomes a positive 25 degrees Celsius. So I get the heat for this first portion of this problem is 0 0.941 kilojoules. For the second portion, I see a flattening of the curve, and now all the energy is going to melting it. So what do I use? Well, I heat. I'm going from solid to liquid, heat of fusion. They tell me I have one mole, and I know that the heat of fusion is 6.02 kilojoules per mole. So it requires that much energy. 
So once everything melts, now I need to go up the curve this direction and I see a positive slope or a delta T. So what equation do I use? Again, I use Q equals MCAT, but because this is liquid water instead of ice, I use the specific heat of water, which we've been using all along. And my delta T is different. Why is my delta T different? Well, now I'm going from zero all the way up to 100. So I plug in 100 minus zero is 100 degrees Celsius, and I get 7.52 kilojoules. For step four, I'm at 100 degrees Celsius. I stay at 100 degrees Celsius, but I convert all of the liquid into a gas. So there's no temperature change, only a phase change. So I'm gonna use my enthalpy of vaporization because I'm doing what? I'm boiling, I'm vaporizing. One mole times the 40.7 kilojoules gives me that. And the last phase is going from steam at 100 degrees Celsius to steam at 125. So because there's a change in temperature, I use Q equals MCAT, but the specific heat is a specific heat for steam, which they give me right here. The specific heat is 2.01 joules per gram degree Celsius. The delta T is 25 because 125 minus 100 is 25. And I get that value of 0 0.0 or 0 0.904 kilojoules. So how do I get the total heat to go from negative 25 all the way up to 125 when I have one mole. I add all of these up. So I'm gonna add Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and Q5 all up. And when I plug those all in and I follow my sig fig rules, I get 56.1 kilojoules. Now it's not gonna always be 56.1. And why is that? Well, I might not have one mole. Maybe I have two moles. So then every place where there was grams, I'd have to double it. So instead of 18 grams, it'd be 36. Wherever there was moles, I'd have to put a two. My temperatures might be different, but I would still follow this heating curve. I always tell students, as if you ever get this problem, literally just go and draw a heating curve to help you see where on the curve you're moving so you can determine, am I gonna use Q equals MCAT? Am I gonna use enthalpy times mole? Or am I gonna use both? And am I gonna use it multiple times? So I hope this video helps and thanks for tuning in.